Hello, hello everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Bamboo History Podcast. My name is Stephen, and for those of you who are new, the Bamboo History Podcast is a podcast about Chinese and East Asian history. If this type of content is up your alley, please subscribe right now. And don't forget to follow my Instagram as well, at Bamboo History Podcast, where you'll find additional historical content, teasers for episodes, and visual content for my podcast episodes. Just to let you guys all know, after this episode, I'll be going on break for Easter up until the end of April, but I'll be back on the 2nd of May. So for all of you who'll be missing me for the next few weeks, don't worry, I'll be back with more exciting content. And I wanted to just give you all a little teaser that when I will be back, I'm going to be posting episodes about China's modern history. That's right, modern history of the last 100 years of China. But I'm not going to tell you what it is yet, so you all have to stay tuned. In today's episode, however, we're going to talk about a really important Chinese ideology, which has shaped the way Chinese people think about leadership, and it's also shaped how China has been ruled throughout its imperial history. So what are we going to talk about? We're going to talk about, of course, about the Mandate of Heaven. So yeah, let's just get straight into it. Firstly, what is the Mandate of Heaven? The Mandate of Heaven, or known in Chinese as Tian Ming, was a way of thinking in ancient and imperial China that dictated who would rule all of China. Tian Ming is spelt T-I-A-N-M-I-N-G. The Mandate of Heaven was the idea that the person who ruled China must be deemed the legitimate ruler of all of China by the heavens. The heavens, or Tian in Chinese, was the ultimate authority in ancient China and was basically God. The Mandate of Heaven was a way of legitimizing a person's claim to be the ruler of China. If he or she ruled China, they needed to have the blessing by the heavens that they were the rightful ruler of China. This meant, if the heavens could appoint someone as the rightful ruler of China, they could also take it away from someone. And they took it away from Chinese rulers who were tyrannical, cruel, or ineffective as leaders of China. This meant they would have deemed to have lost the mandate of heaven. And because of this, one could justify a reason to overthrow the inept ruler. So you all must be wondering now, how did the mandate of heaven originate and why? The mandate of heaven or Tian Ming originated during the Zhou dynasty. Zhou spelt Z-H-O-U. Now before the Zhou dynasty ruled China, China was ruled by the Shang dynasty. Shang spelt S-H-A-N-G. The Shang dynasty had ruled China for over 500 years and had been relatively good and stable, up until the last king of the Shang dynasty, Di Xing, came onto the throne. Di Xin, or more infamously known as King Zhou, Zhou spelt Z-H-O-U, was a despotic king. I've briefly touched upon his rule in episode 38 of my podcast, where I talk about King Zhou's love with the evil fox lady Da Ji, and how his cruelty also may have been exaggerated by historians in the past. Anyway, regardless of whether his account has been exaggerated or not, we can only rely on what the records said, and from these records we know that King Zhou mistreated his subjects, had cruel and sadistic punishments for his people, and had a lavish and wasteful lifestyle. Essentially, things that weren't a tick for being a good leader. Now during his reign, to the west of the Shang was the state of Zhou, Z-H-O-U which at the time was a vassal state of the Shang. King Zhou, however, was jealous and he felt threatened 
by the growing power of the vassal state of Zhou. So he decided to imprison the leader of the Zhou at the time. His name was King Wen, W-A-N. And then, when King Wen's oldest son, Bo Yi Kao, B-O-Y-I-K-A-O, went to the capital city to arrange for his father's release, King Zhou had Bo Yi Kao slow sliced to death. Yeah, that, that is absolutely horrible. So can you imagine how his father would have felt knowing that your son was being gradually sliced everywhere on the body and slowly bled to death because of this mad and cruel king? He would have been really, really mad. Anyway, King Wen was eventually released after the Zhou's ministers convinced King Zhou to release him and then showered him with all these gifts. So King Wen was released eventually. And after King Wen was released, he was really mad about what the King Zhou did to his son. So he plotted revenge. His desire for revenge led to a rebellion of the Zhou against the Shang. And after years of fighting, the Zhou finally defeated the Shang decisively in the year 1046 BCE. And then, the leader of the Zhou at that particular point in time, King Wu of Zhou, Wu spelled W-U, he was King Wen's son. He became the new ruler and the new leader of China. When King Wu of Zhou became the ruler of China, he needed to find a way to legitimise his rule because he took the throne away from someone else, from King Zhou of Shang. This was when the Mandate of Heaven, Tian Ming, was formulated. The way the Zhou kings used the Mandate of Heaven to justify their rule was, the Heaven, or God, would essentially grant the Mandate to someone who would be able to rule the country well. If they didn't rule the country well, then obviously they would lose this Mandate. They used the example of the Xia dynasty to explain this mandate. So the Xia dynasty was the dynasty that came before the Shang dynasty and has been considered China's first dynasty. The Zhou kings explained that the Xia dynasty once had the mandate to rule China, but their last ruler was not a good leader, and then hence they were replaced by the Shang. This then also would apply to the Shang dynasty as well. And because their last ruler, King Zhou, was not a good leader, then in turn, they would be replaced by the current Zhou dynasty kings. As a quick side note, the Xia dynasty, spelt X-I-A, is said to be semi-mythical by many scholars because there's no concrete evidence found that proves that the Xia dynasty even existed. Hence, Some people have actually claimed that the Zhou dynasty created the Xia dynasty as a way to explain the mandate of heaven and to justify their rule. It's an interesting theory, and if anyone has any opinions of it, please let me know. So to summarise, there are four main elements of the mandate of heaven. Number one, the right to rule is granted by heaven, or Tian 2. There is one heaven, meaning that there can only be one ruler. 3. The right to rule is based on the ruler's virtue and how well they rule the country. And 4. The right to rule is not limited to one dynasty and it can be taken away. And that person is deemed to have lost their mandate to rule. The mandate of heaven is entrenched and based on the Chinese people's belief that heaven, or Tian, T-I-A-N, is the Almighty. And how does the heaven manifest itself in real life? Well, it does so through natural phenomena like the sun, the moon, clouds, wind, rain, snow, and amongst other things. The word or the command from heaven, or in Chinese, Ming, spelt M-I-N-G, would be the ultimate law of the land. By forming these two words together, heaven, tian, and command, ming, it then becomes tian ming, or translated as 
Mandate of Heaven. As I mentioned earlier, the Mandate of Heaven originated in the Zhou Dynasty as a way for their rulers to justify their overthrow of the previous Shang Dynasty ruler. The Zhou Dynasty people believed that Tian or Heaven was the ultimate arbitrator of what was moral and immoral in the world. An example I found was a reference in the Zhou Dynasty text Shang Shu, spelt S H A N G S H U, where they believed that, and I quote, Wei Ke Tian De, Zi Zuo Yuan Ming, Pei Xiang Zai Xia, which means the heaven determined what morality was for people to follow. It would therefore make sense that the heaven then would have the right to judge a leader based on their morality and whether they were leading their country with virtue, i.e. being a good, fair and just ruler to its people. Conversely then, the mandate of heaven could also be lost in cases where the heaven determined that the ruler was immoral, for example, unjust, cruel, corrupt or inept. The heaven then would send signs that the ruler had lost their mandate, and these signs would come in the form of natural disasters, and if the common people didn't heed to these warnings, the disasters would become more severe, for example, floods, drought, plague, foreign invasion, you know it. The disaster then would cause so much pain and suffering on the land and its people that the common people would eventually rise up and rebel against this inept ruler. Hence, in the form of rebellion, the mandate of heaven could be taken away, and the person who was able to overthrow the previous ruler and become the new ruler to have gained the mandate of heaven. Obviously, the caveat is that this new person would also have to rule the country well, otherwise, they in turn would also have their mandate taken away from them. The mandate of heaven and the idea that heaven was the ultimate judge of character for the individual has also been incorporated into ancient Chinese philosophy. Confucius, for example, believed that an individual's fate was determined by heaven and therefore it was important to not go against heaven's will. Because heaven was a judge of character, it was important then, in Confucius's view, that an individual had to spend their entire life trying to seek greater morality, or known in Chinese as de, and develop greater awareness of morality, in other words, what is right and what is wrong. Another Confucian philosopher, Mencius, had his view about the mandate of heaven as well. He stated that the reason why the ruler must rule with virtue and look out for his people was because heaven had created the ruler for the sake of the people, and as a result, as the leader, they must rule with benevolence, or in Chinese, known as ren, R-E-N. If they didn't, then the common people would be able to overthrow the ruler and replace them with someone who could rule with benevolence, and the mandate would have passed on. So the Chinese leader in ancient China has also been referred to as a Tianzi, T-I-A-N-Z-I, or translated as Son of Heaven. And the Tianzi ruled the Tianxia, T-I-A-N-X-I-A, which translated means everything under heaven. And these references stemmed from the Tianming mandate of heaven. In other words, the Chinese leader ruled on behalf of heaven as the Son of Heaven, kind of like Jesus being the Son of God in Christianity, and that the Chinese leader or the Tianzi ruled everything underneath heaven. This idea has been the backbone of Chinese history for 2000 years, and the mandate of heaven is evident through the dynastic cycles that has happened over China. So a dynastic cycle is where a dynasty has ruled China for a while, then comes an inept ruler who would ruin the country, which would result in uprisings and rebellion. Then out of this, one would emerge as the new ruler of China, replacing the previous ruler, starting a new dynasty. Then, this would happen again, the new dynasty would rule for a while, until another inept ruler ruined the country. Uprisings and rebellion will happen, and then another person will emerge as a ruler to replace that previous dynasty. 
and this cycle of events would happen in China all the way until modern times. The Mandate of Heaven was also used by non-Han Chinese rulers as well, in particular rulers of the Yuan and Qing dynasties who ruled all of China and were from non-Han Chinese backgrounds. For example, the Yuan dynasty was ruled by people who were Mongols, and the Qing dynasty rulers were of Manchu background. The Mandate of Heaven was also applied in Korea and Vietnam, where dynastic cycles can also be seen in history with these two countries. The Mandate of Heaven also explains a fundamental difference between the Chinese emperor and, say, a Japanese emperor. You see, Japanese emperors come from a single continuous line that originates all the way from Jimmu, J-I-M-M-U, who was the first emperor of Japan and a descendant of Amaterasu, the Japanese goddess of the sun. On a quick side note, I know there is discourse involving the fact that Jimmu is not the first actual Japanese emperor and that he was mythical, but that's a discussion for another episode. For the purposes of this episode, however, we're just going to continue on the basis that Jimmu is the first actual emperor of Japan. Anyway, back to the episode. Therefore, in Japanese history, no one has ever made an attempt to actually replace the emperor, as they are considered descendants of God. And hence why the Japanese imperial house is the oldest continuous imperial house in the world. Chinese emperors are different because of this idea of the Mandate of Heaven. The emperors in China, unlike Japan, are not descended from God. Rather, they have been given the mandate or right to rule as the emperor by God, aka Heaven. Hence, Chinese emperors are able to be replaced and overthrown, which has happened many times throughout history, unlike the Japanese emperors. This ideology, in my opinion, is fundamental in understanding why Chinese people have believed in this idea of one ultimate ruler to rule a country, and can explain one of the reasons why the idea of democracy was never developed throughout Chinese history. It is important to note that whilst the Mandate of Heaven bestowed power and legitimacy for the leader of China, in practice, ancient Chinese rulers have often delegated the actual rule of the country to top-ranking officials, advisors, other government workers, and even other members of the royal family, as well as palace eunuchs. I personally also believe that the Mandate of Heaven not only helped the Chinese sovereign legitimise their rule, but it was also an incentive for them to rule the country well. Otherwise, if they didn't, then they would risk losing their mandate to rule China and then consequently be overthrown. So yeah, that's it. That's the end of an episode about the Tianming Mandate of Heaven ideology. I hope all of you learnt something new. Don't forget to follow my podcast, like my content, give me some good feedback online, and follow my Instagram at Bamboo History Podcast. As the host of the Bamboo History Podcast, I will strive to deliver quality content for all of you. Otherwise, the heavens would probably take away my mandate to be the Bamboo History Podcast host, and I'll probably lose that mandate to someone else. So that's it. Thanks everyone for listening. Enjoy the rest of your day or evening. And don't forget, this is my last episode until I go on my Easter break. So everyone, Have a safe and happy Easter, and I'll see you all back on the Bamboo History Podcast on the 2nd of May. Bye for now.